One of the strongest predictors of software development success is release frequency, but there are many barriers to moving faster. So what techniques work at different release frequencies? Pick the wrong ones and you'll never be able to speed up. That's our topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. How do we move beyond basing our software development only on guesswork instead of taking a more experimental approach? More frequent releases are a key part of that. Without them, we're only guessing rather than experimenting. We guess what our users want. We guess about a solution that might deliver on that user need. We guess about whether or not our software is fast enough, scalable enough, resilient enough. And all of the time, any of these guesses and may be and probably are wrong. So moving beyond guesswork isn't a simple thing. To do that, we need to take a more rational approach to problem solving. We need to proceed in small steps and evaluate our progress after each small step before we move on. So release frequency is a key driver to give us the feedback that we need. But how do we go about increasing release frequency? And which ideas make sense at which speeds? One of the fundamental tenets of continuous delivery is to work in these smaller, more definitive steps. And after each small step to get as clear a picture of the truth of our system as we can. Only by doing this can we move ahead with real confidence and reduce our chances of making mistakes. Anything else depends on us betting on our guesses. And as I said, our guesses may be wrong. They are, after all, only guesses. Until we've tried them out, experimented, we can't really see the difference between the good ones and the bad ones. It's unavoidable that the longer we leave it before we check to see if our guesses are correct, the bigger the cost we will pay if they are wrong. This is why the small steps are so important. If I commit a change to my code and find out that it's rubbish in the following 30 seconds, then the worst that can possibly happen, as long as I'm using version control after each tiny change, is that I lose 30 seconds of mistaken work. If I do the same thing though, but don't commit my change for 30 days or 30 weeks, then I might have wasted 30 days or 30 weeks worth of work instead. This is what the fast feedback and incremental experimentation that is at the heart of continuous delivery is all about. This is not a preference, this is not a whim, this is a fact. Small steps give us faster feedback. Faster feedback means more feedback. More feedback means more opportunities to learn, and so deeper insight into the accuracy of our work. In this episode, I'll explain why releasing more frequently is important and which techniques work best at which release frequencies. If you currently release every quarter and would like to be able to release daily, you must change what you do. But what do you need to change? I'll show you a model that maps techniques to the frequencies where they work best. If you like to learn more about all of these techniques, check out my training courses. We are currently running a summer sale with 20% off any of the courses on our site, so do check the links in the description below. Before I make any more progress on our topic for today, let me pause and thank our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts and Transfic. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on applying the ideas and techniques that we talk about here to build great software for their clients. Transfic is a financial technology company applying advanced CD techniques to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. These companies offer products and services that are very well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, click on the links in the description below and check them out. The longer we wait to merge our changes, the more difficult and so the more costly in terms of time and effort things will become. In continuous delivery, we take this attitude to everything. We want to work in tiny increments so small stories are best. I want to change my code with the minimum of risk so refactoring is a pervasive constant on a surprisingly small scale. 
even to the level of tiny changes to our code. If I want to add a new function or variable, I'll begin by defining what I want in line with my code at the point of its use, and then use my IDE to refactor the code to introduce the variable or function correctly. This keeps my code in a working state for a larger proportion of the time while I'm editing it. We want to test tiny incremental changes, so we use test-driven development to grow our design in tiny steps. And we want to be incremental in adding new features to our systems and releasing them into production too. So we use techniques like acceptance test driven development to steer our development in small behaviorally incremental steps too. We also release frequently into production so that the delta is in functionality between releases is very small. And so we prefer to avoid disturbing riskier big bang releases from our user's perspective. The ability to proceed in small steps is deeply ingrained into continuous delivery thinking and deeply informs the engineering based approach that I aim to promote here. You can look at this in two ways that both end up in the same place. You can see the desire to proceed in small steps as driving us to release more frequently or you can see the goal as being able to release more frequently which encourages us or forces us to work in smaller steps. Either way the result is the same. We're going to change how we approach every aspect of software development so that we can take, make progress in these smaller steps and so win the freedom to release more frequently, whenever we choose to in fact. One of my former colleagues, Paul Hammond, came up with a model that I think rather nicely captures how this desire to release more often changes some of the things that we need to do to sustain it. A diagram based on his ideas was included in the excellent book Lean Enterprise. So let's take a look at how these things help. Our goal is that we want to move forward increasing the frequency of release and these practices help us to do that. I like this diagram of Paul's quite a lot. I've modified it very slightly to make some ideas I think a little bit clearer but this is Paul's work not mine. I like it because it gives us such a useful map of what practices are applicable at what points on the release frequency spectrum. I would add, and I think that Paul would agree, that the practices on the right that are close to essential to achieve the higher release frequencies are applicable everywhere. They work at slower speeds too. But the practices on the left that are applicable only at the slowest release frequencies don't work at all at the higher speeds. Let's examine that idea a little bit. When organizations like Amazon, Google, Spotify, or for that matter, Tesla, say that they release multiple times per day, clearly this is averaged over many developers. Amazon's 1.5 changes per second obviously doesn't mean that every developer is writing features in less than a second. But the demands of continuous integration and continuous deployment still mean that nearly every developer will be releasing small changes multiple times per day. So it's impossible to do that if you have long-lived feature branches, for example, where long-lived is based on the continuous integration definition of more than a single day. Equally, if every developer achieves continuous integration working on trunk, but release branches are used to aggregate changes before a release, then you're clearly reducing the possible release frequencies, so probably won't be achieving daily releases there either because that will be too much work. So to maximize these things, we need to reduce the amount of work in the process. So working on trunk and releasing every small change automatically, if it passes all of the automated tests, is how we can do that. Clearly, if we want to be releasing daily or more often than that, manual testing is simply not good enough. Even a separate QA team will add too much of a barrier on the fast, efficient feedback that we need, so we can't do that either. Remember, the route to true continuous delivery is through finding ways to do the same or better with less work, not with more. So we're always aiming to adopt a strategy of comprehensive test automation for pretty much everything. And changing how we organize our work so that the comprehensive testing is really a side effect of how we do things rather than a job of a dedicated team who will never be able to keep up with the pace of change if they're put into that position. I have a video that explains that in more detail here. Similarly, a separate security team is both too slow and too divorced from the detail of the work. 
Much better to make testing and security the responsibility of the development team so that they can build quality and security into the products at the point of construction rather than attempting to add in these vital aspects of the system later on to an already built poor quality insecure system. So while separate teams don't scale well in terms of speed and efficiency, that doesn't mean that their skills aren't needed. Rather, that their role shifts to become either part of the development team or working as part of an enabling team where their job is to help the stream align development teams to better fulfill their quality and security responsibilities. If you're releasing once a quarter, it's still a pretty poor idea to do the release manually, but it is possible. If you're releasing daily though, you'd be crazy to do it manually. Not only wouldn't it be fast enough, but you'd almost certainly make so many mistakes that your stability would suffer badly, and so you'd end up moving slower because you spend so much time fixing the messes that you made because you were working so quickly. Our job in continuous delivery is not to release crap quickly. We aim to increase release frequency because all the data tells us that this is not only a good thing in itself, but also that it results in an increase in quality. The State of DevOps report have demonstrated over years of study that there is no trade-off between speed and quality. If you want high quality code, you must work fast in small steps. If you want to release quickly, you must do high quality work because otherwise the time we spend fixing things will slow us down. So that's our target, better software faster. These aren't the only practices that work at these speeds, of course, but these are practices that have been proven, demonstrated to work in a wide variety of companies and circumstances. These are the things that will help you to achieve these faster cycles, which is the goal here after all, because these faster cycles are what predict all sorts of benefits that really matter to our development teams and to the organizations that employ them. Paul's model is a useful tool that can help you to match your release frequency to your development approach, and one that I think helps us to understand what we need to do to take the next step towards something better. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoy our stuff here on the Continuous Delivery channel, please do consider supporting our work by joining our Patreon community. I'll take this chance to say thanks once again to our wonderful Patreon supporters, it's a delight chatting with you in the Discord channel. Your support helps us continue doing this work. So thank you again for it.